So today we're going to be talking about uh, mostly Chapter 1, but a bit of Chapter 2 as well. Uh, so Chapter 1 is the nature of geology. Chapter 2 is investigating geologic questions. Um, so what we're going to be talking about is um, what are some of the common features of the Earth and how do they relate to natural hazards and resources. Uh, we'll be talking about what we learn by studying the Earth, the main layers within the Earth, how and where different types of rocks form, uh, what are some of the important Earth systems, and uh, getting a basic understanding of Earth's place in the solar system. So that brings us to our, our first big question. How does geology influence where we live? So take a minute and observe this landscape and try to identify ways that the features might influence where we live. Right, so if you had to put your house somewhere on this image, what would you be looking for? What do you notice? The first thing that I notice is the big landslide over on the left. So I know that I don't want to put my house either on that landslide or near the base of that slope, uh, which is susceptible to sliding in the future. Uh, landslides occur where slopes are just too steep, and it does depend on the rock type. It depends on the level of uh, precipitation. If you've had a lot of rain recently, that can sort of lubricate a slide um, and cause a lot of damage. So you don't want to be anywhere near there. Okay, the next thing I notice is uh, the big volcanic eruption kind of eye-catching there. So volcanoes can destroy um, not just with the lava that we usually think of, but with ash um, as well, settling down and sort of smothering or crushing whatever it lands on. Um, but they're also beneficial. They also provide nutrients to the soil. So um, some of the most fertile, the most productive um, farming land is often near um, old volcanoes. All right, the next one is earthquakes along faults. So faults may indicate potential for earthquake activity. That's those uh, little opposing arrows. They're going in opposite directions. That indicates a fault is there. So a fault is just a fracture in the Earth's surface where um, the large pieces of rock are moving against one another. When they move against one another, just like when you rub your hands together, you generate a lot of friction. Well, it's so much larger when it's with huge rocks. So it's building up a huge amount of pressure, and then it gets released in the form of seismic waves um, resulting in earthquakes. Okay, another thing you want to think about is the type of soil. Um, so that depends on, on what it's made up of, what are its materials, what is the nearby slope, the climate. Uh, some soils can cause a lot of problems if they're built upon. Um, even in uh, the Phoenix Valley, there are some soils, some clays, that when they get wet, they expand. So if you have an expanding clay underneath your house, that's going to cause an awful lot of trouble. Uh, with shifting your foundation, causing big cracks, um, that type of thing. So the type of soil is very important um, as far as what you want to build on, but it's also important if you're going to be growing any food. Um, is that soil contaminated? Is it nutrient rich? Will you be able to grow anything there? Right, and the next um, thing we want to look for is rivers. Okay, so you would think that a river would be a great place to live near because you need water, especially here in the desert. We're very aware of that uh, necessity. So rivers, of course, provide water. They provide transportation, energy, and nutrients for soil, but they also cause flooding. So it is uh, nice to be near rivers as long as you're uh, prepared for it to flood, usually yearly, um, and and then having a much larger scale flood, usually about once every 100 years. Um, so rivers are important for a lot of reasons, but also uh, can cause a lot of 
damage. So those would all fit on your notes packet since we're just getting uh, familiar with that under our five ways that geo geology affects where we live. So we have landslides, number one, volcanic eruptions, number two, earthquakes along faults, number three, types of soil, number four, and rivers, number five. Next, what controls the distribution of resources? In last week's lecture, uh, I talked about resources quite a bit because that's what we have the most contact with in regular life. We rely on mineral resources every day for uh, things that make up our houses, our, uh, every object in our house. R remember the little saying, if it didn't grow, uh, it was probably found by a geologist. So looking at distribution of resources, we want to observe the locations of iron mines which are represented by the blue dots, and we want to compare that to the copper mines that are represented by orange dots. So take a minute and look at this map. Try and see what area of the map seems to have more blue dots, more iron mines, and what area of the map seems to have more of the orange dots, more of the copper mines. It's important to note that uh, they're not evenly distributed everywhere. We don't have a perfect grid of blue dots or a perfect grid of orange dots everywhere. Um, they're split. You find iron in one area, you find copper in another area. So um, it's not the same everywhere you go. Um, and so what we find is most iron mines are located in the Great Lakes region in Canada. So up in the the north and the northeast, while most copper mines are located in the mountainous western part of North America. So that's us. All along the Rockies up the west coast, um, you're finding lots of copper mines. So why do you think that would be? Okay, and take note, where do we find no iron or copper mines? Okay, the southeast and the south central part of the U.S. don't seem to have any iron or copper. So what's going on there? All right, well we know that our natural resources are not evenly distributed around the world. So that goes in our little note box. And now, you've been thinking about it, now I'm going to talk about why or uh, why not? So it's really why not? They are not evenly distributed. Why is that? So most iron mines are in the Canadian Shield. So we said we find them in the far northeast on the Canadian Shield. And they're, they formed there at a specific time in Earth's history, two billion years ago. And that was during an increase in oxygen in the atmosphere. So as um, the oxygen was increasing in the atmosphere, it started reacting with the rocks, with the minerals that were on Earth. They had never seen this level of oxygen before. So now you've got iron reacting with oxygen. Just like if you left um, any bit of metal outside, it's going to rust. That iron reacting with the oxygen in the air, or reacting with um, oxygen in water, is going to rust out that metal. It's the same idea. So two billion years ago, there was this mass increase in oxygen on the planet, and so all of the iron that had been in solution started to precipitate out, started to be deposited. Okay, so that's the iron in the Canadian Shield. That's representing an occurrence in geologic history two billion years ago. It's a little snapshot of what was going on on the planet two billion years ago. Okay, it was not the same environment on the west coast. It was totally different. So that brings us to the copper mines. They're much younger. Okay, 50 to 150 million years. Okay, the iron mines were 2 billion with a B. Now we're talking 50 to 150 million years ago. 
and they're related to events that formed a mountain belt along the west coast. Okay, there are no large iron or copper mines in the southeast because the region doesn't have the appropriate type of rocks or geologic history. So distribution of resources is controlled by geology, such as age and type of rocks and the geologic history. What was the environment at the time when these rocks were forming? Just as the environment on the west coast of the U.S. over in San Diego, it's a beach environment, right? That's different than we have here right now at this time in the desert. Okay, so in environments at the same time can vary. You'll be depositing different rock types um, depending on the environment. So that brings us to our next notes page. And what is inside the Earth? We know that the Earth is made up of layers. And it's broken up. Um, the outermost layer that we live on is the crust. So if you think about an apple, you bite into that apple, the thickness of the apple peel is about the same uh, relatively to the rest of that apple as the crust of the earth is to the inside of the earth. Okay, so that outer tiny layer is what we live on. And we live on the continental crust, which is much uh, thicker. It sits up higher than the oceanic crust. That's why we're above sea level. And they're made of very different rocks, the continental crust and the oceanic crust. So if we take a look at uh, a rock from the continental crust, we can see it's got these big crystals. It's mostly light colored versus this oceanic rock, which is very dark and it has uh, little holes in it. So what we're looking at here is a uh, felsic rock for the continental crust and a mafic rock for the oceanic crust. We'll get into those terms uh, later in the semester, but I just want to introduce them because they're terms that refer to uh, the composition of the rock. What is it made up of? So if it's light colored, we call it felsic. If it's dark colored, we call it mafic. The thickest layer is the mantle. Okay, that's this, this layer. We've got the upper mantle, the lower mantle, and extends for quite a ways until you hit uh, the core. Okay, so again, I would like for you to label this image on your notes. So label the crust, the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core, just like it's labeled here. So we have the crust on the outside, the mantle is the thickest layer in the middle, and we have the outer core in this image. It sort of looks orange and red, like um, magma. And then we have the solid inner core. So looking at the next question, what are the two types of crust? We have continental crust and oceanic crust. And what is a noticeable difference between continental crust and oceanic crust? So uh, really there's two. The first one is color. Continental is light. Oceanic is dark. And then we also have thickness. Continental crust is thicker than oceanic crust. All right, the next question, what is the thickest layer in the Earth? The mantle. And the rock that we're looking at here as the uh, representative of the mantle is very uh, unique. And we actually have a volcano in Arizona uh, where you can go and pick up these beautiful rocks if anybody was born in, in August. Uh, this is where you get the gemstone Peridot from. And so you can actually go, there's a place called Peridot, Arizona, uh, and you can go pay a little mining uh, fee and go and pick up these beautiful rocks that um, are rich in minerals like Peridot, uh, olivine, all of these uh, green minerals. So this is what the mantle looks like. Uh, most of the time when people think of the mantle, you think, oh, well, it must be hot and 
and red and molten and flowing around, well, no, it's actually um, mostly solid. Um, so it is a solid that is able to move around under these high temperatures and high pressures. Uh, but it's green. It's these beautiful olivines and peridot minerals. All right, what is the core made of? The lowest layer of the Earth is the core, and that's made of iron and nickel. Um, there is a molten outer core and a solid inner core. So that is how the inner core is different from the outer core. The inner core is solid. The outer core is molten. It's, it's liquid. It's melted. Okay, and they're made of iron and nickel. That's because when the Earth first formed, it was completely molten um, and cooled from the outside in. But over time, all of the densest material sank to the center, um, iron and nickel being the most dense. And now that you've already labeled your uh, image in your notes, it would be nice if you, over to the right, uh, could make a little sketch to represent the different layers of the Earth, just to reinforce that you understand we have the core at the center, uh, followed by the mantle, followed by the crust. All right, so look. And now we can talk in a little more detail about the crust and what lies just below it. So you have a blank image on your notes. And I'd like for you to label the lithosphere and the asthenosphere in this drawing. And it'd be good for you to be able to pronounce those. So give it a shot, even if there's somebody around. Don't be embarrassed. Lithosphere is a little bit easier. The root of that is lithos, which means uh, rocky. And just below the lithosphere is the asthenosphere. Asthenosphere uh, is weaker and hotter. So what parts of the Earth make up the lithosphere? If we take a look at this image in these brackets, the lithosphere is the rocky outer area. And that includes uh, both types of crust. So we have continental crust and oceanic crust. And it includes the uppermost mantle. Okay, So that outer layer of mantle is included in the lithosphere. And do all Earth's layers have the same strength? Well, if we just said that the asthenosphere is weaker, then certainly not. Um, the uppermost mantle and continental and oceanic crust, because they're close to the surface or at the surface, they have the lowest temperatures. They're cooler and more brittle. Uh, they break more easily, but they are solid whereas the asthenosphere um, is more like putty. It's able to move around. It's able to flex and bend. So the asthenosphere is hot and weak and mostly solid. So I'd like for you to be able to draw a sketch of this so that you know the relationship between both types of crust and the uppermost mantle as the lithosphere and the weaker hot material below the uppermost mantle that makes up the asthenosphere. All right. Why are some regions high in elevation? So taking a look at this image, we want to observe this figure and note the relationship between elevation and the underlying crust and the mantle. So the crust is all gray, either light gray or dark gray, and the mantle is represented as green. So what do you notice about this and about thickness? For the highest elevation, the areas that stick up highest above sea level and the areas that go down lowest below sea level. All right, regions with continental crust are higher than oceanic crust. Again, that's why we are above sea level. Continental crust is above sea level. And regions with thick crust 
are higher than regions with thin crust. Some mountains can be built on top of the crust, uh, but the idea here, you can kind of think of it like an iceberg. So uh, some people will say, oh, that's just the tip of the iceberg for a situation, meaning uh, you can only see the, a small bit above the water and there's a huge plug going down below the surface that you can't see. The same thing applies for continents. So if you have a mountain that extends up very high into the air, that mountain has a big root below it extending down into the earth. So the thicker the crust, the higher the elevation. The thinner the crust, the lower the elevation. So the thinnest crust is going to be found in the oceanic crust. So this is just an uh, extension of that. There's nothing in your notes for this to explain why some regions are higher in elevation than others. So here we're observing the relationship between the height of each block and its thickness relative to other blocks. So take a minute and look at this, uh, noticing the size of the blocks and how they're sitting in the water. All right. So hopefully you notice that the thick blocks sit higher than the thin blocks. Okay, the thinnest block being all the way over on the left, and that's sitting quite low, with the exception of this thick block all the way on the right, which is sitting at about the same height as that very thin block, which means it must be made of denser materials. Um, density just means you have more material packed into the same volume. Um, so an example I, I like to use, and, and you'll find I kind of use my cats a lot as examples. I have a big fat cat. He's about 20 pounds, and he's got all this loose skin. He's just this great big guy. Um, takes up a good amount of space. Um, and my friend has a Maine Coon cat. Those are these big, hulky cats. Uh, they look like they were made to live in the wilderness. And he is just all muscle, but he is 20 pounds as well. So um, the point being, my big fat cat uh, is less dense, right? Uh, he's this great big flabby guy. He's not very densely packed. Whereas this uh, muscly Maine Coon cat, you've packed a whole lot of material into a smaller space. So uh, <laughs> that's my explanation of density in kitty form. The relationship between crustal thickness and elevation is called isostasy. This is the last question on uh, this page of notes. So what is the relationship between crustal thickness and elevation? It's called isostasy. I-S-O-S-T-A-S-Y, isostasy. And again, that just means the thicker the crust, the higher the elevation. The thinner the crust, the lower the elevation. Now, we can think about what forces and processes affect Earth's materials, either from the inside or the outside. So you've got the same figure in your notes. And you've got a little chart. What are the major processes that affect our planet? So you're going to list the forces on the left column. And is this an internal or external force on the right? So you're just going to write internal or external. Or if you are really feeling lazy, you can put an I or an E. Uh, because you've got that written at the top, you'll understand what it is. Alrighty. So our first force is atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure, that's the weight of the atmosphere pressing down on the surface. So if we're at a lower elevation, if we're uh, on the beach by the ocean at the lowest elevation, there's more atmosphere sitting on top of us. So there's a higher atmospheric pressure than there is when we drive up to the mountains. So if you're driving up to Flagstaff, you might hear, uh, feel your ears pop because it's releasing pressure. There's less atmosphere 
atmospheric pressure at higher elevations. Um, so that's an external force. It's outside of, um, or rather, it's not within the Earth. Okay, it's on the surface, so that's an external force. Our next is gravity from the sun and from the moon. So both of those are pretty important. Both of those are external forces. Gravity from the sun and moon. Uh, gravity from the sun keeps us in orbit, keeps us uh, rotating around the sun, which is kind of a nice thing because we need it. Sun uh, light to warm the earth. We need it for uh, circulation of wind currents, for circulation of ocean currents. Uh, we need the sunlight for plants to grow. We need it to uh, fuel the hydrologic cycle. We've got to be rotating the sun. Our entire planet has evolved for this position. All right. Um, so, we're very familiar with gravity from the sun, but what about gravity from the moon? Um, the moon exerts more gravity on the Earth because it's so close. Um, so it's a much smaller object, but uh, because it's so near to the Earth, it can exert a strong pull on it, and that's seen in uh, tides. So um, ocean tides, when the tide comes in and the tide goes out, that's all dictated by the gravity of the moon. All right, and again, both external forces. The next one is the sun's energy. So not just um, the pull of it that keeps us in orbit around it, but everything else I was listing of why we want to be in orbit around it. Uh, the sun's energy. So we're looking at the electromagnetic energy uh, radiating, radiating from the sun. That is what we need. Again, external. The next one is wind and ocean current. So blowing wind moves sand and dust and it also makes waves. Ocean currents move water and redistribute heat. Um, so ocean currents and wind currents act to move uh, very hot air and hot water uh, around the equator up towards the pole where it cools off and then it sinks back down. And when we get to climate, we'll talk uh, so much more about that. It's very interesting. But again, um, not inside the Earth. It's above the surface, so that's going to be an external force. All right, now we're talking internal forces. So gravity from the Earth. Earth's gravity causes a pull downward, so water, ice, and rocks move downhill. Anything is going to move downhill, right, thanks to our gravity. If you jump off a wall, you're, you're going to fall down very quickly, uh, thanks to gravity. If you throw a ball, it's going to eventually hit the ground because of gravity. Um, so the same applies for all natural forces. Rain falls down. Um, water flows from a river up high in the mountains down to sea level, uh, making its way down to the ocean. Um, the same goes for ice in the form of glaciers um, and rocks that are uh, falling downhill. Okay, everything is working its way to the lowest elevation possible, thanks to Earth's gravity. And again, that is internal. All right, forces within the Earth. Really, this is referring to tectonic forces within the Earth. So anytime I talk about um, mountain building or volcanoes or anything like that, plate tectonics, I'm talking about tectonic forces within the Earth. So the weight of overlying rocks pushes down which is countered by forces pushing up and from the sides. That's what we're talking about for forces within the Earth. The next one is radioactive decay. Radioactive decay is the breakdown of elements. And as that happens, it gives off lots of energy. So it's producing heat. <coughs> 
and a large amount of the Earth's internal heat um, today is a result of radioactive decay. And our last one is heat transfer. Heat can be transferred from hotter rocks to cooler ones, such as near molten rock magma. Okay, so if you're near a magma chamber, like these little squiggly arrows are, you have extremely hot material next to cooler material, which is the gray rock, and so heat is being transferred from the hot magma to the cooler rocks. Just like if you put your hand on a hot iron, heat is being transferred from that hot iron to your cool hand. Not, not so pleasant for you, but it's not as big a deal for these rocks. All right. So that covers all of our forces. So our external forces are atmospheric pressure, gravity from the sun and moon, the sun's energy, wind and ocean currents. Those are all external. Our internal forces are gravity from the earth, forces within the Earth, radioactive decay, and heat transfer. All right. Our next question, the bottom of the page here, is how does gravity from the Earth influence the movement of material on the Earth's surface? So I mentioned all of this with um, when we talked about the gravity from the Earth, but just to repeat that, everything is moving downhill um, is the main idea there. How does gravity from the Earth influence the movement of material on the Earth's surface. It makes material move from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. Okay, everything is moving downhill. All right.